Welcome to the Blazor Quick Start Guide. My name is Ed Charbonneau. I'm a senior developer advocate for Progress Software and Microsoft MVP. Over the next few minutes, we'll be learning about the Blazor architecture. We'll discuss the tools that we need, and we'll walk through the project types and learn about component basics. Blazor is a fully featured application framework by Microsoft. It has a huge ecosystem of .NET packages because it's compatible with .NET standard. Blazor is independent of its hosting model. This means we have options when it comes to hosting Blazor applications. The most common options are client and server-side hosting. Let's discuss the two options, starting with client-side Blazor. In a typical application, JavaScript is downloaded by the browser. It's then parsed, compiled, and turned into bytecode before it can be executed. A more modern approach is to use WebAssembly, which is a standard bytecode that the browser can execute. This is what makes WebAssembly different. It's that it's parsed and compiled before it's delivered to the browser. Languages other than JavaScript, such as C++, can be compiled directly to WebAssembly bytecode. Microsoft has taken the .NET runtime and compiled it to WebAssembly. This makes it possible to run .NET code directly in the browser. This is how Blazor enables developers to write .NET code in a client-side web application. Because the .NET runtime is available on the client, we can utilize virtually any .NET standard library. When we run Blazor on the server side, Blazor runs as a .NET executable. The client receives a small JavaScript application that treats the browser as a thin client. This thin client connects over SignalR with our server application and keeps the browser and Blazor application in sync over events and updates using the SignalR connection. We have options with these two hosting methods. We can go client-side and have little to no server overhead. We can write a RESTful application similar to the way we do with Angular or React. We can go offline and make our app PWA compatible. However, with client-side, there is a larger payload size, and we're dealing with a disconnected environment. On the server side, we have smaller payload sizes. There's less abstraction because we're already on the server and we can communicate directly with our data persistence. We can also leverage pre-rendering. However, there's always a persistent connection required and we have to manage our own server resources. Next, let's discuss what's required for creating a Blazor application. First, you'll need the latest version of ASP.NET Core 3.0 SDK. Visual Studio Preview Edition is required. And you'll also need the Blazor extension from the Visual Studio Marketplace. The latest version of all of these is required to successfully create a Blazor application. For more information about prerequisites and where to download the necessary installers, visit blazor.net and click Get Started. Now that we have the prerequisites installed, we can jump into Visual Studio and start a new Blazor project. In Visual Studio, click File New Project and select ASP.NET Core Web Application. Click Next, name your project, and then click Create. Inside of the New File Project dialog, you'll see three selections for Blazor templates. There's a server-side template, an ASP.NET Core hosted template, and a client-side template. The client-side template and the ASP.NET Core hosted template are both client-side Blazor applications, with the ASP.NET Core hosted application also having a web API project inside. For this example, we'll use the server-side project. With the new project created, let's take a moment to explore some of the components that are included in the template. If we open the Pages folder, you'll notice there are several components. These are identified by the .razor extension. Let's open the counter component and take a look. The first line of the counter component is our page directive. This makes the component accessible from the browser through the route slash counter. There's also some markup included in the component, which includes a placeholder for our current count value. 
This is bound inside of our code section. The code section of the component contains all of the logic for the component itself. You'll also notice an increment count function. This is bound to a click event on our button inside of our counter. All of the logic for the counter component is all written in C Sharp. If we click run and open the application, you can see the counter component in the menu. And if we click the button, it increments the count. Let's look at the fetch data component. The fetch data component also uses a page directive. It includes a using statement and an inject directive. The inject directive allows us to use dependency injection in our component. In this case, we're injecting the weather forecast service. If we scroll down to our code block, you'll see that we're using the weather forecast service inside of an event called on init async. This is an asynchronous lifecycle method that is called when the component renders. When the method is complete, the component will then re-render. In this example, we're getting weather forecast service and applying it to the forecast array. When that array receives data, it will then for each over a razor template to display the weather data. In this video, we learned about the Blazor architecture and how to quickly get started. In the next video, we'll learn all about component basics and how to build a brand new component from scratch.